There are those who say that this is ordinary, but don't let that fool you. Mother will always be the bravest, least ordinary, most difficult, utterly challenging career that anyone ever hopes to lay claim to. While others might hear, diaper changer, food maker, laundry doer, carpooler, bottle washer, sweatpants wearer, life on hold, want to be doing anything else, woman. The truth is, whether it feels like it some days or not, you are in fact a shelter from the storm. You are a cape of good hope. You are a warrior who will do battle for your children's hearts, souls, attention, innocence, education, and memories. Go to battle, my friends. This is your time. We will hold strong on either side of you. We will pray for those bottles through the dark watches of the night. And when doubt comes and children break, when adults fail them, and when they push and push as hard against us as the day we deliver them into this world, we will not be broken. We may ache and see cracks tear through our hearts. But we will get up again tomorrow and we will load the clothes and the words that need to be said again and again and again. And when the world tries to claw at them, to break them, to smash the beauty in them, may our walls hold true. May the lessons we've told the truths we've lived, the life we've spoken into them come back easily, predictably, with wash and repeat ease. Kingdom business, Jesus work, this shaping of souls, this raising tiny humans. There are those that say this is ordinary. Don't buy it for a second. Mighty. You are mighty because you, Mother. Moms are mighty, aren't they? And, they're, and really, there's so much more. And I think that every one of us here, you know, we have a, a relationship with our mom. Maybe the, the worst case scenario is, is that uh, maybe we didn't have a great mom. You know, that happens sometimes. But she brought us into this world. She gave us the gift of life. Best case scenario is that we have someone who is an incredible example of God's love and someone who has given us strength and hope and character and, and everything that we've needed all through the years. And, and I tell you something, as, as, we, as we celebrate moms today, we don't just do it because it just turns out it happens to be Mother's Day today. We do it because we believe that. We believe that moms have an incredible role to play in the lives of their children. And we lift you up and we pray for you. And that needs to be the, the way that we honor you today. Maybe with all of that in mind, we can better understand the mother of two of Jesus' disciples, James and John. If you've got your Bible, let me encourage you to find Matthew chapter 20 in the New Testament. Uh, we're going to be in Matthew 20, and, and we'll show you all the Scripture on the screen behind me as well. Uh, but we're going to read verses 20 through 23, and, and I want you to listen to this story about a mother 
who loved her sons an awful lot. Now, you may have some things that you think about this mother when I get done reading the story, but remember this, that she definitely loved her sons. This is Matthew chapter 20, starting with verse 20. It says this, Then the mother of James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to Jesus with her sons, and she knelt respectfully to ask a favor. What is your request? He asked. She replied, In your kingdom, please let my two sons... Sit in places of honor next to you, one on your right and the other on your left. Verse 22. But Jesus answered by saying to them, You don't know what you're asking. Are you able to drink from the bitter cup of suffering I am about to drink? Oh, yes, they replied. We are able. Jesus told them, You will indeed drink from my bitter cup, but I have no right to say who will sit on my right or my left. My Father has prepared those places for the ones that He has chosen. Now, you can say what you want about the mother of James and John, but you cannot deny a couple of things. Number one, she loved her sons, and she wanted the best for them. You guys agree with that? No matter what you may think, and Jesus kind of chided them all for their attitude here, but do we agree that she loved her sons, and she wanted what was best for them? And number two, she was fully aware of the teachings of Jesus about His kingdom. She was aware of, of the kingdom issues that were at hand. She was also very aware of the fact that her sons, James and John, she was aware that they were very close to Jesus, that they were two-thirds of the inner circle of Peter, James, and John. And she was certain that when Jesus formed His kingdom, whatever that was going to look like, because remember, they had a little bit different understanding of what was going to happen when Jesus came into His kingdom. She had a belief, she was certain, that they would surely have positions of responsibility and of authority. Now, at this point, it's pretty easy for us to conclude that what James and John's mother was, was kind of selfish, right? Right? I mean, come on, she asked Jesus for a special place in the kingdom for her sons, for goodness sake. I mean, she apparently thought that her sons were special, that they deserved more than the other disciples. Now, surely there's not a mother here today who's ever felt that way about her children, right? No, no moms here, surely none of you have ever uh, embarrassed yourselves or your kids because of those strong convictions about them, right? Surely nobody here would ever have done anything like that. One day, a, a Little League baseball coach was talking with one of his players, and the coach asked the little boy, he said, Do you know what cooperation is? What it means to be part of a team? And the little boy nodded. Good, the coach said. Do you understand that what really matters is that when we win, we win as a team. And if we lose, we lose as a team. And the little boy, he, he nodded again. And the coach said, good. And he continued, so when you're at bat and a pitch is called a strike, or if you're called out at first base, you don't argue with the umpire. Because that is just... That's, that's not just a poor reflection on you. It's a, also a poor reflection on our team. Do you understand all of that? And the little boy nodded a third time. And the coach said, good. Now go explain that to your mother. <laughs> well, in the first part of this same chapter that, that we just read from, Jesus tells the story. And here's the thing. Here's what you may not understand if you don't know the context. He tells a story that probably disturbed the mother of James and John. All right. So we look at, at what she said and we're like, ah, I don't feel real good about that. But you've got to remember there was more going on than just what was said there. He tells a story about a landowner who went out to find laborers early in the morning. And you guys may be familiar with this story. They agreed upon a fair day's wage and they started working. And then at noon he went out and he found some more workers and they started working. And then towards the evening he went out and he found even more workers and they started working. And yet, the, when, when the master paid them off at the end of the day, he paid all of the workers the same wage. Do you guys remember that? Does that sound kind of familiar to you? So everybody worked different amounts, but they got paid the same amount. And, and it must have caused the mother of James and John to wonder, is that what's going to happen to my sons? Do you see that? Is that what I have in store for them, for me, for them? Is that what's going to take place? I mean, after all of the sacrifices they've made, and understand they've made sacrifices, they walked away from their life, right? And, and after all the investment that they put into Jesus, all of the danger that they have put themselves in in order to follow Him, 
and be called His disciples, are they going to end up getting the same thing as someone who has barely made any sacrifice at all? I mean, you can appreciate her concern, right? So when the opportunity presented itself, she came to Jesus to, she, to see if she could get this kind of cleared up, I think, in her own mind. And I want you to notice how she approached Him. She didn't come to Him in anger. She didn't try to draw attention to herself. She wasn't loud and obnoxious like you might expect that she could have been. Matthew says that she knelt respectfully before Him. And she made this request. She says, Jesus, when you establish your kingdom, would you save seats on your right and your left hand for my two sons? Now again, we might kind of criticize the mother of James and John for what seems like a lot of presumptuousness. But instead, here's what I want us to do. Let's look at what she actually requested of Jesus and what Jesus actually communicated back to her. And I'm telling you, in this story, I think we will find not only a mom who wanted the best for her children, but also a mom who, who displayed an example every one of us can walk out of here today and follow. Inside your bulletin this morning, you'll find your message notes. They look like this. Let me encourage you to take those. And, and I just have three takeaways I want to give you this morning. I want you to consider as we walk away on Mother's Day. First of all, I want you to notice that when she came to Jesus... The mother of James and John asked that her sons might be a part of Jesus' kingdom. She asked that her kids, her boys, her sons could be a part of the kingdom. And here's the deal. I can think of no, important, no more important task of motherhood than that. To seek to ensure that your children are a part of the kingdom of God. You know, mothers have a lot to pray about, don't they? Sometimes they pray out of necessity. Sometimes they pray because motherhood just isn't easy. It's extremely difficult. James Dobson tells about a time he came home when his son Ryan was just a, a small baby and it had been a terrible day for his wife Shirley. Ryan had been sick. He had cried all day long. And as, as his wife Shirley was changing the diaper, the telephone rang and she reached over to answer it. And before she could you know, fasten up his diaper, at that exact moment, Ryan let loose, as baby boys sometimes do, just you know, all over his mother. Okay? Happy Mother's Day, right? And, and, and so, you know, you can kind of imagine what that was like. And, and she cleaned up the mess and she put him in some clean, sweet-smelling clothes. And then she took him into the living room and fed him. But as she was burping him, he threw up all over himself and her and the couch. And right, moms? Every, it just, if it could go wrong, it went wrong. And James Dobson writes, when he came home... He said, I could smell the aroma of motherhood everywhere, right? You know what I'm talking about? And, and he said that his wife, he said, my wife, Shirley, she cried out to me, I do not remember all of this in my contract, right? <laughs> sometimes mothers pray just out of the frustration of it all. And sometimes in the frustration of trying to teach our children, we realize the difficulties of communication, I remember very clearly the first time I gave my daughter, Mackenzie, her very first responsibility. She was about four years old. I told her to watch Joshua, her baby brother, while I stepped out of the room. Now, you guys agree, that's perfectly reasonable, right? To have a four-year-old watch the baby, okay? And I was just going to be gone for a moment, all right? And, and, and I, I had just stepped out for just, I mean, I hadn't been gone three seconds, and I hear a thump. And then I hear Josh start crying. And I rush back into the, to the room and, and I find that Josh, he, who, uh, I did, did I mention I left him sitting on the couch? I mean, I've mentioned that part. This would not be the first or the last time I let a baby fall off of a better couch, right? Yeah, I, I had a little bit of a, th I just, I thought they would bounce better than they do. But I come back into the living room and there's Josh. He's not on the couch anymore. He's laying on the ground. He's stretched out on the floor. His little face is just, you know, bright red. He's screaming his head off. Meanwhile, Mackenzie, you know, little angel that she is, she's just sitting there. I mean, she is looking so innocent. I mean, she's just looking at me. She's looking at him. She's looking at me. You know, like what? And I said, Mackenzie, I told you to watch him. And Mackenzie, <laughs> Mackenzie answers... I did. I watched him fall and I watched him cry. 
I did exactly what you told me to do. She's always been one to follow directions. I'll, I'll give her that. Uh, being a parent, it's not easy. It's not easy. And sometimes it's filled with joy. And sometimes it's filled with sadness. And you know what? Sometimes your children make you so proud, you just want to pop your buttons. And other times, you can't find enough Kleenex to dry all your tears. Right? When you're a mom, when you're a dad. But think about this. As much as we love our kids and as much as we want to give them and as much as we want to do for them, what good is it for our children if they are successful in making money and driving nice cars and living in great neighborhoods if they don't know God? In other words, what does it matter if they gain the whole world but they lose their soul? You see, being a parent, it's not easy. It's difficult. But James and John's mother, she gives us a valuable example. Because she sincerely desired that her sons would be a part of his kingdom. And we need that same concern for our children. I hope that in the heart of every mother, every father here this morning, that there is a burden to go to the throne of God and to pray for our children. To pray that they would be saved. To, to that pray that they would know Christ and choose Him as their Savior. Do you understand that is the most important job you have? To be a mom who wants to bring her child into the kingdom of God. Secondly, not only did the mother of James and John ask that her children would be part of Jesus' kingdom, but also she desired that her sons would be involved in the work of Jesus' kingdom. Write that word in. She, that they would be involved in the work of Jesus' kingdom. And, and let me ask you a question. Is it enough just to be saved? As a Christian, do you realize that churches today are full of people content to just fill a pew on Sunday mornings? There are plenty of people willing to sit back and, and receive the blessing, but seldom get involved in doing any of the, the real work of the church. Now, that's a problem. I mean, that's, a, that's an issue that we struggle with, that we deal with, that we try to address all the time. But let me ask you this. Where does that attitude towards service begin? You, you tell me. Where do, do they learn that attitude, our kids? It begins at home with mothers and fathers. Setting the example, praying that their sons and daughters might be involved in the work of the kingdom. That they might value what it means to serve and to give and to be a part of what God is trying to do in this place, in this community and beyond on earth. To, to do it as teachers and leaders and as disciples of others. That they might be the ones to go out into the world and find the lost. To see that the church continues on until Jesus comes again. James and John's mother desired that her children would be actively involved in the work of his kingdom. And that needs to be our desire as well. Not just for our kids, but you know what? For ourselves. For ourselves. And, and, and listen, I'll, I'll give you the, the application here. You, you say, you know, I, 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 I probably, I, it's time for me to serve. I, I need to set an example for my kids. I need to do this because of my relationship with God. What, what do I do? How do I get started? Can I just, can I tell you a great way to get started? It's, it's built in. It's coming up. We do something every year called Vacation Bible School, right? I just got the yes from Christy Klein. And, and I'm telling you, it ta you see, look around you. It takes this many people to make it happen, doesn't it, Christy Klein? It started like a year ago. I'm not kidding. In getting ready and getting prepared for what's going to happen. Why would we do that? Why would we spend so much time and effort and energy and money and resources? Why would we do that? Because I'm telling you, it is one of the most important ways for kids to come to know Christ. Just for seeds to be planted in their heart, in their life about God and His Word and serving Him and reaching out to other people. I mean, it's just this incredible, intense, one-week opportunity for them to get a great big dose of God. And it takes all of us to do that. And many of you are, are signed up and committed and, and, and you're going to be a part of that. But it takes everybody. We've got all, all these little jobs and big jobs and we need prayer warriors to be praying during that week. And I promise you there's a way for you to serve. And if you'd like to, this morning, if, if something God would, you know, just kind of touch your heart and say, you need, to, you need to do something, you need to get started. Let me encourage you. Go find Christy Klein and, and say, hey, I, I want to serve. Tell me what I can do. Show me how 
I can serve and be a part of Vacation Bottle School. You know what? Model for your kids the kind of servant you want them to someday be. Does that make sense? Model the kind, and you say, hey, I, I, you know, I, I can't do it. I'll be gone that week. I'm gonna, I work at night, whatever the case may be. I, I get that. I totally get that. Find a way then to model the kind of servant you want your children to be someday. Here's the third thing I want to show you. The mother in James and John, she had big expectations. She had big expectations. And you know what? I like that. I like that. See, she didn't just pray that her children would be doorkeepers. She wanted them on the right and the left hand of Jesus. Now, let's, let's take a cultural snapshot here because that, that may be a little bit hard for us to appreciate what that means. In that day and age, there was no higher position in a kingdom than those on the left and the right of the king himself. Okay, And that's what she wanted for her sons. Now again, we may consider this mother to be kind of brash, maybe presumptuous, but I'll tell you something, I admire her boldness. Because too often, we settle for mediocrity in the church. For too long, we've been content with just barely making it through the door. For too long, we've been content to sit back and just let things happen to us instead of us being a part of helping things to happen. It's time for some of us to take our position on the left and the right hand, not because we think we deserve it, not because we just want the blessing from it, but because we believe that God wants us on the front line of the battle. That's who we can be in the kingdom of God. Becoming leaders, reaching out to lost and hurting people, taking the message of Christ into all of the world. You see, God has called each of us to become a disciple. And what we have to realize about discipleship is that it requires sacrifice. It requires sacrifice. You realize what Jesus said to the mother when she asked can my son sit on the left and the right? Do you remember what she said? She, he said, I don't think you want that. I don't think you realize what you're asking, right? He said, are they going to be able to drink from the cup of suffering that I'm going to drink from? And what are these, you know, kind of these boys who didn't really know? They were grown men, but they didn't really get it either. Because what they say, oh, yeah, yeah, we can, we can drink from the cup of suffering. Well, what was Jesus' cup of suffering that he was talking about? It was the cross, and he said, you know what? Jesus comes back and he says, you know what? You are going to drink from that cup of suffering. Because guess what? Every one of them was going to die. Some of them on the cross. Some of them in, in unimaginable ways. And Jesus already knew that. And he said, yeah, yeah, you're going to drink from my cup. He says, but you know what? It's not my place to decide whether you sit on the left or the right. So in a way, he kind of chided them. He said, hey, you don't really know what you're asking for. Isn't that kind of how it is, parents, moms, when it comes to our kids? We know sometimes they don't know what they're asking for. But at the same time, it's a reminder to us that he was telling that the discipleship requires sacrifice. That it's not just about what we get. A big part of it is what we give. And, and you know what? I guess that's part of the reason that today is so special. Because we recognize that a mother's love is probably the closest example that we have to God's love. It's a love that sacrifices itself over and over and over again and would even dare to lay down its own life for its offspring. There's not a mom here today who wouldn't give up her life for her son or her daughter. There's a true story told about a man named Solomon Rosenberg. This is a picture of his family, Solomon and his wife, and their two sons, and his mother and his father were arrested and placed in a Nazi concentration camp during World War II. And this was a labor camp, and the rules were very, very simple. As long as you can do your work, you are permitted to live. But when you become too weak to do your work, then your life ends. Are we all on the same page here? Well, Rosenberg eventually watched his elderly mother and father marched off to their death. And he knew that next would be his youngest son, David, because David had always been a frail child. He'd been very sick as a baby. He wasn't really well. And Sol Solomon knew that his son would probably be next. And so every evening he would come into the barracks after his hours of labor and he would he would search for the faces of his family. 
And when he would find them, they would huddle together, they would embrace one another, and they would thank God for another day of life. Now just think about that. That's what they were being thankful for every day. I have my family. We have one more day of life together. Well, the day came when Solomon Rosenberg came home, came back to the barracks that night, and he didn't see all of the familiar faces that he was looking for. He finally discovered his oldest son, Joshua, in a corner, huddled, weeping, and praying. And immediately he knew. He knew what had happened. He said, Josh, tell me that it's not true. And the boy turned to his dad and he said, it's true, Papa. Today, David was not strong enough to do his work. And so they came for him. And Rosenberg was just racked with grief over the loss of his son. But then something hit him. He said, but where's your, mo where's your mother? And the boy said, oh, Papa. When they came for David, he was afraid and he cried and he cried. And Mama took his hand and she said, David, there's nothing to be afraid of. I'll go with you. You know what? That is motherhood. It's loving your child so much that you want the very, the very best for them and from them. It's loving them enough to sacrifice, to provide them with everything they need, and sometimes it's loving them enough even to say no, isn't it, moms? It's loving them so much that you would give up your own life for them if you needed to. And do you realize that this kind of love, though it's often experienced through a mother, it, it doesn't originate with a mother. You know where it comes from? It comes from our Heavenly Father. Your Heavenly Father loves you in all the same ways and even more. Because not only did He love you enough to die in your place, He actually loved you more. Because He was willing to sacrifice His own Son for you. Think about that. So that you could have an abundant life now. Serving Him on earth every day of your life and then celebrating Him as part of the kingdom of heaven someday when you die. That is how much He loved you. And I think we get a glimpse of that love every day in the love of our mothers. You know what, moms? This is your day. May God bless you in it. And thank you for modeling in your life the love of our Heavenly Father. Will you bow your heads with me? God, as we just celebrate and say thank you today for our moms, and, and it's you that we thank, because we understand that they're a gift from you. We know that our children are a gift from you to us. And, and God, we wouldn't want to miss the opportunity on this day to celebrate a love that is so sacrificing, that does so much, that goes so far, and that even would be willing to lay down its own life for us. But God, we have to recognize in that your love that says not only would I give up my own life, I would give up the life of my one and only son. God, that's something that not one of us in this place would do. We cannot even imagine sacrificing one of our children. And yet you were willing to do that for us because you loved us, because we needed you so badly. And you made it possible for us to have a life, an abundant life now, and an eternal life later when we die. God, thank you for that. And thank you for that love shown through our moms every day. Father, I pray for anybody here today who doesn't know you. Maybe they know about you. Maybe they've read some things about you. Maybe even sung some songs about you. But God, not yet. They've not yet stepped across that line that says, I know about you. And now I trust in you. And I trust you, Jesus, as my Savior. I pray that on a Mother's Day, 
someone might choose you and make you their heavenly father. God, I love you. Thank you again for our moms. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.